I think the most important thing to notice when we look at that arc from the 1980s all the way to the beginning of this century, the first decade of this century, is that we built hardly any universities. I think they, they have opened one or two Cal State campuses in that whole period. But we built 23 prisons. And we went from a prison population of about 20,000 when I got here in 1977 to 180,000. And now, of course, the population of the state grew a bit, didn't quite double, grew about uh, 140% or so, but the prison population expanded about 500%. And that was the era that we were in as the century, this new century began. It was a time when we had essentially disinvested in our hopes and doubled down on our investment in our nightmares. We were really scared. We can talk about some of the things that caused California to be that frightened and that unoptimistic in those years. Well, let me fast forward again to 2011. And I picked that year out because in that year, the US Supreme Court decided a case called Brown versus Plata. How many people in this room have ever heard of Brown versus Plata? Raise your hand. I'm, I'm pleased that a handful of you have. But Brown versus Plata, I think someday will be recognized as a pivotal case, especially in this state. Because it basically ended mass imprisonment, or began the end of it in the state. At that point, our prisons were so overcrowded that federal courts had decided that we couldn't basically deliver basic health care let alone mental health care, to the large number of people that we were accumulating in prison with serious physical and mental health problems. And they basically ordered us to reduce our prison population. And what's remarkable is, over the last six years, we've, we've reduced it by around 50,000 uh, people, mostly through diverting folks to probation, sometimes to jail. And guess what? There's been no explosion of crime. In fact, crime has not gone up. Now, there is one category I should mention here with it. And that's auto burglary. And I do hope you didn't leave anything in your car before you uh, walk over here today. Because auto burglary has gone out. We don't necessarily think that it's because of this. But if you think about the kind of fears that led people to build a massive prison system, it was not auto burglary. Uh, it was fear of murder, fear of rapes, fear of armed robberies. And we haven't seen that. In other words, we've had a dramatic drop in our prison population with no real increase in crime. In fact, crime has continued, thankfully, to go down, a trend that's been going on since the 1990s. Now, the other thing that happened in 2011, and I think it was that year, and I was trying to remember with David Maldonado here, what year the first underground scholar initiative students showed up here. But I remember, I think it was around 2011, I was sitting in my office when I met a man named Danny Murillo, uh, who was one of the underground scholars that you'll see about in the movie. And when he told me his story, I couldn't quite believe it. He had not only been in prison, but he had been in if, if prison is sort of the, the darkest, uh, most extreme face of the state, he had been the most extreme part of the prison space, the uh, solitary confinement system. And here he was at Berkeley, not just coming to visit me, he was a student at Berkeley. And, and this opened up a, a, an idea I had never even really allowed myself to think, which is that somebody could survive the darkest part of our state's fears and our, 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 our tendency to often do harm to people because of our fear. And, and not only recover, not only survive, but thrive to the point that he could be at UC Berkeley preparing himself for an extraordinary career, I, I expect, of public service and leadership. And that is what, what you're about to see in, in a moment. I want to just kind of close by saying that we're at a really pivotal moment in this state. But as I said, we, we've dropped the prison population dramatically, but we have a long way to go. We are still criminalizing way too many people. We're not necessarily putting them in prison as rapidly as we used to. There's way too many people in our jails, way too many people on probation. I think we've got to take some part from what we've seen over the last 20 years, which is that California cities, California residents have managed to rebuild their communities in a lot of ways, not necessarily with help from the government, but at least without interference. But we now need to up our investment. Right? We have, we, we, if we're not building new prisons, which is fortunate, we're still not building enough new universities or new K-12 facilities to, to build the ladders that will get uh, those students here. But I think the, 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 the trajectory of these students and, and the tremendous film that you're about to see about them is an inspiration that will, I hope, be a guide for us as we think about how we can kind of recover as a state from this long period of mass incarceration and get back to being the state of innovation, creation, and optimism that we've also always been. And thank you very much.
thank you for watching the film. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, before we go into the panel, I wanted to introduce Sonia from Root and Rebound. Um, Root and Rebound is this great organization based in Oakland. And um, what we've been doing is we've been partnering with them. Whenever we have a screening, we pass out Root and Rebound pamphlets um, for those who um, might be able to use their services. And Sonia's going to explain a little bit more about Root and Rebound, and then she's going to sit on the panel to answer any other questions you have about the organization. Hi, everybody. Should I try to get the lights on in the back? Are you guys okay? You're okay. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Sonia. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me and for passing out our information at other screenings. I'm really glad that you're using it as an opportunity for folks to learn about the work that we do at Root and Rebound. Um, and I'm just always really moved every time I see films like this. I feel like increasingly there's there's been a stronger awareness within the documentary filmmaking community about the success stories and humanizing people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system and other systems, because we know it's not just the criminal justice system, but there's a huge connection here with immigration detention and the foster care system and a lot of systems that we've, we've created and made huge over many, many years in this country. And so I'm just always so happy that things like this are being shown in so many places, not only because it gives hope, but for folks who don't know, I think it can really change minds. Um, I come from a very small white community in the Midwest in Wisconsin, and these stories are not known. I get emotional watching them because I can share this with my family so they understand what I do and why it matters to me. So it's, and I'm just always so grateful. I get really, truly emotional for people to open their stories like that because even though we're watching it as a film, so I think there's a bit of like, it can seem surreal, but I know those are your real lives that you're opening up and talking about your childhoods and your families. And for all of us who've experienced like loss or poverty or struggled in some way, I think it's really difficult to, to sort of bear that, but it also creates sort of like, I think there's so much strength in the vulnerability. So I just wanted to say thank you first. Um, so just real quick about Root and Rebound. Um, we are an organization based in Oakland. Um, we actually got our start pretty much here at UC Berkeley Law School. Um, our director and myself were both law students there in 2013. It was around the same time Danny was actually and, and Stephen were really s starting up and launching Underground Scholars, so it was sort of like a cool energy happening at that, at that moment. Um, and our whole focus of our organization is about reducing, eliminating, getting rid of the barriers that people can experience for the rest of their life because of an arrest or a conviction record. Um, what is so shocking and unbelievable is that really there are laws in place in this country that flatly allow discrimination against people because of a history in the justice system. And some of those laws don't have any room for showing change, for showing um, that education has happened for showing rehabilitation, there's still blanket bans in our law, categories of people that we've put into the, to saying, no, you can't. Um, one of the big issues that we work on that I think is really relevant to the higher education context is about occupational licensing barriers. Uh, and Root and Rebound's actually working on three bills um, in coalition with many, many other groups and people who are directly impacted experts in the legislature this year that I'm happy to talk about after. Um, but the whole focus is on actually making it possible for folks who are qualified, trained, and educated to pursue careers that require state licensing. 20% of jobs in California require permission from the state to do the job. Being a lawyer requires permission from the state bar to do the job. And really, all that really means is a criminal background check. That's the primary reason, in my opinion, that licensing agencies have been set up, is to basically screen out people who've had prior justice system involvement. And knowing who's impacted, you can understand how that then affects the type of work and careers that people either can do or choose to do because they believe that there's no way they'll overcome those kinds of legal barriers. So there's actually 48,000 laws on the books across this country at the local, state, and national level that discriminate against people with records for that reason alone. Um, in the way that certain things are protected under the law based on your race, your age, your gender, disability status, and so on, ethnicity, criminal records is not a protected status, even though it overlaps with so many of those other ones. It's not a fully protected status. And there are lawyers out there trying to make creative arguments on why it should be because of its connection with race, and there's been movement in that space, but still under the law, 
there is a second tier of citizenship that's happening in this country. There's still many places in this country people can't vote um, because they have a felony record. Um, people who are incarcerated in California cannot vote. So, and there's a bill up on that too coming in this year. So there's a lot of ways I think for those who are in this room, if you're moved by this, on actually removing the barriers, you have a political voice um, and a way to get involved if you're, if you're not otherwise already um, involved. And, and Root and Rebound is an organization that provides legal advice for free to anyone who has an arrest or conviction history across the state of California. We run a free hotline every Friday, so if folks ever have legal questions, issues with their parole or probation, questions about reunifying with their children, post-incarceration, um, employment, housing rights, things like that, they can give our, our legal team a call and it's a totally free service and we do clinics across the state too. So there's a lot of um, sort of services that we do, but I think even more important than the legal stuff is really moments like this and films like this that can create a change and a shift in attitude and culture because the laws aren't gonna change until people actually are able to be in leadership positions, humanized, um, I, I couldn't help but notice that there were a lot of very light-skinned professors in that film, for example. That's part of what in institutional racism and discrimination looks like, right? And so I also see that this new wave of students who are coming into higher ed are going to change the face of these films in the future. Hopefully it'll be Professor um, Williams and Professor Maldonado that we're seeing, right? And I think that makes a huge, huge difference on who's teaching criminal justice too, right? So I'm really, really excited to be here and really humbled and, and grateful for being invited. And I'll be quiet now, but I'm happy to answer questions after. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to go into the panel. So if you want to come back up. <laughs> so before uh, we're going to open it up in a minute, and, uh, I think, thought maybe uh, you've met all of these folks on the screen in that absolutely gorgeous, beautifully shot and deeply moving film. Um, I thought I'd, I'd maybe get us started here with a, a, the following question. You, you've all been here at UC Berkeley now for some time, um, and you've been surrounded by students and professors that at least think of themselves as well-educated, fairly enlightened people. What do you see as the biggest myths about prison, jails, and people who have been there that, that you find in the environment around you, even in this educated environment? And how do those myths obstruct? How have you found that those myths kind of create obstacles or problems for, for formerly incarcerated people in, in, in building the lives that they are trying to build? An easy question. <laughs> I thought for one of you, is it enough? Is it uh, that's a volunteer. That's just recording you. So I see. But wait, I don't think you have a mic, so just talk loud. Project. That's kind of a giant question, right? Like, yeah, Um. I mean, there's lots of places I could start. I think one of them is, is sort of, you know, I'm going to start with the standard story of, of mass incarceration and not, you know, I love uh, some of Michelle Alexander's main argument, but I think she gets a couple of things, you know, kind of twisted up. And so that's probably where a lot of people start their legibility is from this idea that sort of trans historical, which means always, right? Like always slavery, always settler colonialism. And I think we need to disrupt that narrative and, and realize that while white supremacy structures and, and structural racism structures the space that we're in, we need to pay attention to our resistance. And so at the end of slavery, you had reconstruction. And so Jim Crow was actually a, a reaction because white supremacy is actually weak. We need to celebrate our resistance, right? It was a reaction to reconstruction, to the idea that you could have an abolition democracy, right? And so if you look at sort of the civil rights, that's another moment where it has to react because it's weak. So let's stop, let's stop making white supremacy so strong. And like, let's maybe look at this as like a moment where our resistance is going to count again. And so like, I, I kind of want to disrupt the trans historical narrative of sort of mass incarceration. Like it's always been about sort of this logic. Um, and make sure that we're, we're, we're paying attention to our resistance, because our resistance matters, right? Um, and I, I could go you know, into some other, I think we need to be wary around the way the state reconfigures itself. 
And so I agree with about 99% of what Professor Simon says. I know he's open to, to push back on some things. I don't, I am kind of weary of sharing the same optimism about 2011. I think the state is, I, I agree with you that, that we're, we're cutting down the prison population and moving people to jails and so forth. But I think if you look at sort of the meta around sort of uh, mass criminalization and targeted surveillance and the modes that, 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 you know, limit our liberation, I think we're seeing a moment where the state is going to move to sort of, uh, you know, uh, algorithmic policing, decarceration, and we'll have digital cages. And, and, and one of the arguments that Ruben Miller makes about incarcerated citizens, they're also subject to, because they, what you just talked about, they lose their sort of, they lose their citizenship rights, they're subject to control from people in their actual community, from their family members, who are also at risk from the state. And so I think we're seeing a conjuncture where these things are sort of coming together. We need to be careful around what the state is doing. And that, that would be my plan. That was a fucking case, man. That's <laughs> <laughs> not treacherous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, for me, like, one of the biggest myths, like, and I, and I say this all the time, it's like, one of the biggest myths is that once a criminal, always a criminal. You yeah. feel me? Like, I feel like, Stigmas help create laws, and from that, barriers are created, right? But as you saw from the documentary, I just shoot everybody up here, or I didn't even know people in your personal life. Like, no, like, it's not once a criminal, always a criminal. You see, we get out, we're trying to do the right thing. We just want to get back, and we're going to use our experience to do that. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, but that in itself is like, like, stigmas are so, like, they, they, they're so deep and they're so big. And I just, for me, like, I just want to challenge everybody, like, okay, you read the news, or you see this and you see that, and you hear about the person doing this and that, right? But it's like, at the end of the day, like, when somebody gets out of prison or jail, like, just don't automatically assume that, you know, they don't go back to doing the same thing. Because there are, there are laws, there are policies in the place that force us to do that, you know what I mean? It's like, it's hard to get a job. It's hard to get housing and all the all the stuff above, you know what I mean? So it's like it's like people try to get like they want they come out and want to do the right thing. But as the way that society is set up around all the structures, there are barriers to doing the right thing. Okay? So for me it's like just stigma in general. So I want to challenge everybody, like you hear you see it, you see something that comes out on Facebook, whatever, like the fake news, all that, you know what I'm saying? So it's like just kind of like you just secondary thinking and just kind of think uh, beyond what you see in the, in the media. That makes sense. Uh, for me, it's basically the same thing too. It's the stereotypes and stigmas, and it's about changing the language also. Because in that clip that you seen when we was in that class, she accidentally said one day, "expelling," and I was like, "Oh, you know better. Like you shouldn't use that language." And she was like, "I apologize." Because, you know, that's my, that's, she's one of my mentors also. And so I think it's the language that you use around people who are formerly incarcerated too. And that's why we say formerly incarcerated, so we humanize ourselves because we are not those. It's kind of like forever a felony, you just go to felony town. Like, it doesn't really make sense, you know? And so for me too, it's like stereotypes and stigmas. And what does somebody look like that's been to jail, you know? So when people meet me, and they be shocked, like, yeah, I've been, I'm, Incarcerated. I've been incarcerated. I've been incarcerated. But oh, for real? Like really? What did you do? Like, what was actually that? I was like, she's like, you killed somebody. Like, and then she started trying to play around. I was like, yeah, I killed somebody. Like, you know, no, I didn't. I was like, don't ask me that. Like, what the hell? I was just taking her to Cal Day, and people come up to the table, our table, Berkeley and Brown Salas, and then the two of us start saying, for me, I was like, you know, I just want to start acting a certain way. I'm like, oh, thank you, thank you. Because they're not going to be over there, you know, because really everybody is affected by mass incarceration, whether they ignore it or not. Your taxes go to keep people in jail, you know, the police, the, the people are traumatized by all the police violence. Everybody is affected, they just don't know how, you know. And so, yeah, it is for me to also, it's a stereotype system. 
Well, let me open this up and, and see if our audience would like to raise some questions to our scholars, to our filmmakers. Please. Go ahead. So um, I'm in the business of working with um, formerly incarcerated people and their programs and helping them get money. And I'm so impressed with you guys and what you're doing. And I'm wondering, um, like, do you have, where does, you, where does the money come from to get all this going? Because it's such a great investment because it'll pay off many times down the road. But I just you could give a shout out to you. Are there donors that are like, Doing, or do you need money and I'll help you love it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I think we, we kind of have, we have strange relationships in the state of California, but we're also, uh, and I just want to ask about it at some point, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you asked what? what? Did the state has, has made some of those? Yeah, the state actually made them. Because it's the only funding we've gotten. The school hasn't given us anything. While they celebrate our inclusion and they make us officially part of the university, that doesn't come with money. Yeah, yeah, we're working on that. But I, I want to kind of take a step back because I feel like the story, uh, our origin story, starts with sort of two guys that were in the shoe and were in solitary confinement without fully picking out that story. Is Wendy Pacheco, one of the incredible women that was here, was on the ASUC and got us our first funding. So two women senators. Uh, her dad's in life, and so, you know, those kind of, you know, I always, I feel like there's a gender politics of the story that gets left out of the origin story a lot of time. And so we got our first money from student fees. <laughs> we got our second money from the state of California. Uh, Lonnie Hancock, before she left, left us a, a half a million dollar grant that we were judiciously, very, you know, carefully through. Uh, and yeah, we're looking at this next cycle and kind of being nervous about it. But I think, Moves like this kind of move us in the right direction, but we can find more. We do it in the tunnel. And, <laughs> and Nancy, um, Senator Sanders, she's looking at us like she gave us two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and so they're writing that into the policy of how when we can get the money without getting the same thing as the five hundred thousand dollars. They don't want to write into that because they're like, you already have money, so now we got to figure out different ways to use this new money. So we're in the Working, working with other community colleges and helping them get part of that funding and send their students to us so, you know, we can use that $250,000 to help other students at community college get into higher education. And so that's one of the stipulations of getting that money. So we're in a conversation of getting that. And then we got money through Lane and we hire like some staff, some students, and that's going to be funding for them. We get money through the work of City College, and then we get the tech, we have got the tech for that. And so we're applying for a lot of grants, like every other nonprofit, we steady writing grants. Like this is a non ending <laughs> cycle of grant writing that our program director, she does, she does a lot of other things too. And, uh, but yeah, like we like said, school still hasn't really funded us, although we're CE3, and you know, and we still pay for rent. So while we're inclusive, we're not inclusive. You know, we're still like we're, we're not up there with like the other um, CE3s. We're not being treated as equals just yet. I feel that's a personal opinion, but yeah. No, and that's a that's a really valid opinion. I feel like when it comes to funding, it can get really political. Uh, in fact, I mean, I, I'm talking about like for individually, like one of the people who have funded my scholarship in graduate school, they just they just they just left. So, um, <laughs> but I feel like. When it comes to funding orgs that work to uh, scale back on mass incarceration and, and do something about it, it's very political because it's like, and I even had a person tell me like, because I, I, I talk to donors, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's harder to, it's harder to sell, if you know what I mean. Like, like I'll, I'll compare it to like something like um, LGBTQ rights or like immigration, right? Like to to like get people to donate to the cause of helping people get out of jail or like just prevent people from going to jail, it's, it's much harder to sell because like again, it goes back to the stigma. It's like, okay, these people did something to get in there, you know, so obviously they deserve to be there, but no, like th that's not the case because there are laws set up and policies set up in place to basically force you to get in there. I mean, and we can't always say because somebody did something wrong, like just because it's a law doesn't mean it's right. So like at one time slavery was a law, but that doesn't make it right. So I think we need to challenge ourselves in thinking about um, 
right versus wrong because we got a lot, we, we, we got a, we got a lot, a lot of laws to change out here. I mean, like, yeah, this is, this is the law professor right here. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's advocating on behalf of that. Um, but yeah, our funding is, 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 is minuscule because it's like, we could, like, if we were given a lot more, if we were given more money, just imagine, just imagine the people all across the country, like, the people who are in jail or in prison, like, just imagine what we can do for them. Like, we're not, we're not exceptional, you know what I mean? Like, anybody can do this. They just need the resources and opportunity. But, like, back to your question, like, about the funding, we, we hustle our ass, we hustle our butts off. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, Pretty much. yeah, people are, are willing to give. It just takes courageous people to do I believe in your cause. If I could just comment on that, because I do think you, you face, uh, even in a state that seems to be recovering some of its uh, sort of perspective on crime and punishment, a presumption of dangerousness about the people who have been in jail and prison. That doesn't fit our era, right? It might have, if you go back to the 60s, we had very few people in prison. You had to do a lot to get there. It was one thing. We have expanded incarceration so much, right, that First of all, that presumption is not uh, valid anymore. And the second point is, we kind of there, there's an assumption that many of us, even who are uh, progressive on this issue, have that there's there's a kind of debt to society model. I call it that somehow people who have ever done a crime owe this kind of debt. And first of all, what about the punishment, right? So there's an idea that that debt never gets paid. The debt somehow is never payable. But the other point is, how many you know? We if we all look at our own lives. Or can we find some source of debt there as well? There's a lot of un unresolved, un, uncalled to account crimes in this country, and I don't see the moral skies falling because of that. So I think we need to really challenge that assumption uh, that many of us have, that crime creates some kind of debt. Crime is often a product of uh, extraordinary circumstances, and we need interventions, but not this kind of lifetime judgment that somebody is somehow part of another tribe because uh, a judge sometimes said you're guilty of something. Yeah. Other, other questions? Yes, right over here. You could bring us to these spaces. Who better than people that live their same experiences? Bring us to these spaces. We're always more than willing, if we got time, to like always do outreach. You know, like who better than to, you know what I'm saying? Like I remember in high school when I was, you know, still active and all that. It was uh, I had um, some uh, some teachers that were really like invested in me, right? But they didn't understand like nothing I was living through. So it was like this. Miss Hanley, I remember her name, but it was, I was like in 10th, 11th grade, and she was like a white older uh, woman, but she was really invested in me, she was like, hey, like, but she didn't understand my struggle, and I think that's where it got a little murky, she was like, why don't you just leave your gang, you know, like, without understanding gang politics and what underlies, and then I was like, oh, because, like, they're the only people that I have around if I leave my gang and I don't have nobody, you know, and my problems will go away with the enemy gang members and it's like, why doesn't your family just move kind of thing? And I was like, well, you think we live here because we want to live here, you know what I'm saying? So that misunderstanding, so it's like, if you would have gave me somebody else that actually knew that politics, I might have paid attention to them, be like, oh, they know what they're talking about, they live through this, so, um, but I, like, just from that conversation, I was like, you know nothing about what you're talking about kind of thing, so I kind of, discredit what came after, even though, like I said, she's like, she tried to help me, like, apply to, like, a Stanford summer program to get me away from the neighborhood and all that, but by then I had already discredited her because of, like, her not being, to understand my lifestyle in general, even though she had good intentions, but if you bring us to these spaces, that's what I'm saying, like, if I had somebody that liked me from my area to come, I might have listened and paid attention. But I don't think that was a pivotal point in my life. My pivotal point was, I think, sadly after I was incarcerated, and like my partner, like believed in me when I wouldn't believe in myself, and she was like, "You can do this. You can do this." I mean, I was already like 24, and I was like, "Nah, I'm not going back to school." 
And she, put, she like, didn't force me, but she kept repeating it. So I was like, you know what? Like, if you think I could do it, I was like, and you've been telling me for like two, three years, like, fuck, I'm gonna try it, you know? And it's like, I actually did well. And it's like, we need those people that are constantly believing in us over and over that don't give up, you know? Cause everybody else gave up on us at some point. That's why we end up in situations. Cause society as a whole has given up on us. And even our own family members, you know, like, my brother's been incarcerated multiple times, but I'm doing a 20 year term because everybody left them to hang, you know what I'm saying? Like out by himself, it was like, he was the black sheep. So they're like, oh, we knew we were gonna end up in prison at some point. And we knew you were gonna do something good at some point kind of thing, you know? And it's sadly how it manifested, but I think it's because he didn't get that love or the belief in him that I got. Like if they would have believed in him, like they believed in me, maybe he wouldn't be in there right now. But I think it's just people believing in us and constantly reminding us that y'all believe in us. Wow. And you know, when you said that, it reminded me of the study that I read. I read the study of how families that come from low income neighborhoods, they pick that one child that they see might be special. They put all their energy and their effort into that one child. And they leave the other child by the wayside. Because this one child is going to be the child to be the savior and it's going to take us out of our debt, our poverty. You know, when it's going to become famous, or this child is good at school or play sports. But that's common. And so this other child ends up going to jail and living this rough life and actually had just as much potential as this other child. And that's that's all too, that's too common. And for me, like, just to echo what, what both of them are saying, I think um, Richard really touched on an imperative point. So for me, it's like, it's twofold. It's policy, like structurally, what can we do to help create a pipeline of people who are not hard to become successful? And then it's like, there's kind of training that we provide people who work in the juvenile hall, because that's important as well. Uh, so I went, to, I went to juvenile hall, right? And uh, I was a senior in high school, and my, my folks, like my parents and my family, like they had to fight for my diploma, you know what I mean? And there was like no kind of advocacy system set up. It was like, okay, all right, this guy, all right, he's a juvenile hall, but like he still, he can still get like his high school diploma, you know? And, and, then, and, and, and then to add to that, like when I, we did successfully, get my uh, high school diploma, but it took a lot of work. Like they had to basically send me my homework while I was incarcerated to finish. And then like while I was in juvenile hall, I think it's probably different because I, I went there like in like 2005 or six, there was like no actual um, program or any kind of structure set up to help me reintegrate or do something once I got out. Um, and I feel like that played a big role in why I relapsed back into the same criminal behavior once I was free. And um, like, and again, to go back to Richard's point, like, you no, know, we have to have people that look like us in there, you know, and who are trained. Because when I was in there, like, there were people that, I mean, there were people that looked like me, but again, they still have really conservative views, you know what I mean? And I think that, because uh, you're working with, like, you, and you, like their minds, it's that people, like you aren't fully developed, you know? So when you tell them something, it's gonna stick. Like I had this woman tell, this woman tell me, while I was incarcerated, she's like, a, like, a, like one of the workers in there, and she told me, you're gonna go to prison, right? And I like internalized that. And when I was in prison, I'm like, she said that, she was right, you know what I mean? And and, and I harbored that. But now I'm like, you know, yeah, I did go to prison. You know, I'm at Cal now, what's up? And like, <laughs> and we used to have like, like, we used to have like this wall, like she used to have like this, these, these walls up and it was like the wall of shame. But like, there wasn't no like wall of success, you know? And like the wall of shame, she would just put up everybody who went to prison or like somebody who had lost their life or something like that, right? And I was like, you know, well, what's up with the wall of success? Cause she like, oh, you know, we ain't got that. But I think that, Hit her up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's good. But, but yeah, like just to go back to your point, I think that we definitely need structural programs set up that uh, give you the tools or to provide them with some kind of training to where they could reintegrate. I know reintegrate is like a loose word, but it's like set people up with something they can go back to, go back outside with, you know. And then back to Richard's point, like, no, we need people who are equipped and trained. Like, you don't need nobody to humanize you in there. I mean, because that's people just at the end of the day, they're going to take that and they're going to internalize it and then it's going to play a role in what they do when they get out, you know. 
So um, I hope that you know answers. Well, I'm not saying Monday and Wednesday. I'm just doing all work time. I think Monday and Wednesday, and I'll just I'll get it to the point of it, and I'll sign you off. Great. Other questions? Please, right here. I would like to know how to bring the film and you all to the new hall. Scott, would you want to join us? Oh, yeah. Um, you can email me at <laughs> um, gmail.com. Um, Fight film, F I T E film at gmail.com. Good job. Um, oh, yeah, we will work with yeah. you and help you organize the screening and bring everyone in who can make it. Thank you. Yeah. So one of the things I found really inspiring in the movie was the way that you each went to your neighborhoods and, and you weren't just on campus, you, you were talking about those neighborhoods. So would you say a little bit about sort of your futures and how you see your ongoing connection to the places that you came from? It sounds like it remains important to you. Let me start with that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm from West Berkeley, or what was formerly West Berkeley, and so I think there's a reason why, and I was going to actually ask Skyler, like, I think we should go to where I'm from now and look at the yeah. Apple store and the Pete store and sort of like, because I'm kind of, I'm kind of displaced, I'm kind of homeless, right? I, it's, it's a strange feeling for me because I'm from a place that don't exist no more like it did, right? It experienced advanced gentrification, like that was the edge of the barrio. That was H2O, that was the hood. That's where like black and brown folks uh, lived together and had a politics of like, of like, uh, of coming together, a politics of assembly, of political education that is sorely needed, right? And so it's a strange feeling for me to be from here and be at a place where I no longer, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so it's difficult. And, and so I just want to flag that. Good point. Some of the communities are literally being yeah, transformed yeah, by yeah. gentrification it, it, and whatnot. It's, it's, but, it, yeah. but you will eventually be one of those professors in the classroom changing the picture. Yeah, that's what's up. I guess for me, um, I'm actually not doing Chicano studies. I'm doing an uh, education program with uh, teaching credentials to go teach, hopefully, at the high school where I come from. Because I still go back home. I mean, I'm from San Jose, so it's not that far out the way, like an hour away. So I go over there on the weekends, you know, every once in a while, and it's like, my head hasn't been gentrified that much yet. And so it's because, you know, white folks are scared that it's so violent. Mm -hmm. So um, my thing is to go back and teach at that high school with the understanding and the capability of one of, one of the youngsters has a drama, like my gang ties ended on, I guess you say good terms, where I can hit up one of the gangs they from and be like, hey, like, you trying to do school, like, was good kind of thing. So that's something no other professor that I know or teacher can ever do, you know what I'm saying? Like, if they could have done that for me, I would have got out of hell of trouble and I would have gone straight to a four year, but they couldn't because they, they didn't have ties to the communities. There were teachers that were coming out of from where they were from, you know, like, so I think being from that community and having access and like, being known in that community that you teach in will hold a lot of weight for me, even though I know it's not gonna work out perfectly in that way and I'm gonna get heat for it. It's like, at the end of the day, like, that's my, what I see my purpose to be, to like, go back. Yeah. Well, I said, like, speaking, I, I like that, I like that question, Professor. Uh, like, being from Berkeley, like, that being from West Berkeley, H2O. You hear that moment? They say from people West Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm from South Berkeley. And I do believe like like this is this is Cal Berkeley, right? And just growing up like back down there, like I would say it's like what you said, access. Like we see like Berkeley, like it's here physically, but uh, intellectually, mentally, like it's it's so far up. Like we do not see. Like we don't grow up down there. Like seeing ourselves here at Berkeley, unless it's through like sports or something like that, right? Or, like unless it's through like sports or scholarship or something like that. So, um, like, yeah, growing up, it's like all right, that's Cal. Like we would come up here all the time, like just to telegraph and like come like crash frat parties as like kids and stuff like that, you know, get and, and be asked to tell the lead and get the police call on us and all that stuff, right? But, yeah, so but like the, the vision is like, but 
but I never ever saw myself as a scholar at Berkeley, you know, and that's that's you look like one another. No? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? You know, so we rock, you know, we rock the cow, break the gear all day in my neighborhood. Like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Basically, represents the town. Yeah, all that. <laughs> but it's like at, to actually like be a student here. Like, I don't think that resonates with with, with, with anybody. You know what I mean? In, in, in our community, unless it's through sports. And it's, it, like I said, it's messed up. And And, and, and it's like, it, it's, it's a different world. And I feel like, again, like it just, it takes these stories to get out there. Like I have people from like, from my hood all the time. Oh, you go to Cal? Like somebody asked me, oh, you, would you play sports? Yeah, I'm all for sports. I'm old. Like, I'm like, I'm not on sports for sure. Like, that just goes to like, the, 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 yeah, exactly. Like, that just goes into the, the narrative and the, the perception that people have. It's like, to get into Cal, you gotta get in through like the sports or scholarship. But no, it's way more easier to get in here through uh, academics. And you don't gotta be the smartest person in the world, you know what I mean? I just think it just takes people like us to like show that, you know what I mean? So it's like, uh, just alone, like sharing these stories is so powerful. Like everybody, when you go home, when you do this, you do that, you talk to somebody, let them know, like, hey, they, they did it and you can, you can do it. It's a possibility for you too, because I ain't gonna lie. School ain't for everybody. I mean, yeah. the fact that you got living role models up here, the living truth and the proof, does mean it's possible. Please. I don't know how many comments. I don't know how many thank you. You know, thank you for uh, turning the light. You know, and uh, showing that there is a way that you can do it. You know, and there is proof. I think like from from where I'm from in LA. You know, there's three choices, uh, jail, to the future, and death, right. you know? And it is kind of the truth. So, you know, when I saw the movie, I got very old, I don't have to say Yeah, thank you for that. Research focuses, but also advocacy as well. Uh, Banner Box, like initially, you know, you start, it started from all of us right now, right? So, you want to just define it? Quickly. Yeah, right. Like, so, it's like Banner Box pretty much uh, is the sentiment behind it is don't judge a person off their conviction history, right? And it's like, let a person showcase their qualifications and skills first before you judge them based on that, right? And um, if the sentiment behind it is really clear, but when it comes to implementation, it can get a little murky, uh, if, if, if that makes sense. And uh, for, for the university, like like state, the state of California and, and like local communities, they've been advocating for Banner Box for a long time, and it's been uh, imp implemented like in different counties across California, uh, different jurisdictions across the state, and but the university itself, like they didn't adhere to like that kind of policy. Uh, they weren't open. They, I mean, like they didn't. They weren't aware of it or anything. But it's like we at this university and we teach in social justice. We we, we teach all this stuff, right? But like at the, at, the, at the same time, like we're not practicing it, right? So um, as far as what we did as an org, we uh, we noticed that and. We, you know, we took it to HR and we told them like, hey, this is um, an unfair practice. But for them, it wasn't like they were doing it on purpose, it's just that they, were, they wasn't educated, they didn't know, right? So uh, a lot of the advocacy just came from like sharing our personal stories and kind of being like these role models in front of them. Like, hey, like if you had a felony and you saw this you know, question on the application, what would you do kind of, kind of thing. And I think for them, it was like the fact that they didn't know that this is a deterrent. Like, this is really, this is a deterrent. Like, people say, I mean, every, oh, I'm out of it. They automatically eliminate themselves. This is stuff that people talk about in prison before they even release. Like, I got a felony. I can't get a job anymore, right? So, you, so we, 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 we advocated for that. And uh, as of now, the university, they, uh, their, their practices 
uh, well, now they, they, they ask at the end, like once you're a, uh, once you have been selected as like, you know, once you've been given like a conditional uh, offer of employment, then they, then they, then they scan you, you know. But uh, Band of Boss is like, it's been statewide and like under like Assembly Bill 1008, that has expanded Band of Box across the whole state. And now it includes uh, private employers, you know. But like I said, like advocacy, with it versus if, like it's, it's it's so it's so different like like this is the dream but then when it's implemented it's like it's a whole it's a whole another like area that you gotta gotta address like that's the sentiment behind it but when it comes to implementation like I think we could do we could do like a really better job of how of how it's implemented and then there are like the studies that have come out that um, convey that Banner Box is an ineffective policy and it actually has an adverse effect where it's actually harming minorities. <laughs> but it's got the white people though, right? So when you think about that, like, so 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 just to elaborate on that a little bit more. So Banner Box, again, is called statistical discrimination, right? And what employers are doing is like, since they can't ask that question, they're basically assuming, like, you know, like on your resume, like based off your name. Or, or whatever, like anything that they don't have it, like information on, they're gonna assume off of that, like you have a criminal record. So what the study is saying is like, that's basically, uh, it has an adverse effect and people aren't getting employment opportunities behind it. But like that's, that was, that, one that, was, that, was, that was one study, it was, a, it was a pretty big, it was a pretty big study. Uh, I mean, like we have, we have, I mean, uh, what we do in my program, like we, we really take these studies and we, and we do like program evaluation, and it was a pretty effective study. But like it was based in one, it was based in one, um, one area, so to say. And I guess for the university, on the other hand, I feel like it, like it's it's it's, it's racism, it's institutional racism. Like that's just that's just what it is, right? Uh, but we could uh, implement like. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like, it's, 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 it's bigger than that. And is somebody, one of y'all, yeah, yeah, yeah. help me out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, 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 could you say a little bit more? Yeah, I was, I was going to add um, to that a little bit. I agree like, with everything yeah. you said, first of all. And so, one of the things as a legal advocacy organization, Root Rebound really struggles with is that, and, and Professor Simon, you talked about some of these things, that the laws are changing, right? So we have Prop 47, Prop 57, SB 260, SB 261, we have banned the box, first we went public, then we went private. Laws are changing. I've, I've only been at Rude Rebound since we started five years ago, and all those laws have happened since we started, right? In the state of California. But there's not an investment attached to policy change so that folks on the street, in prison, in jail, actually know right. their rights that employers actually know they have to change their application. Go home, look at Craigslist, go to the job ad, tell me, tell me how many job applications you can find online that still ask, do you have a criminal record, do you have a felony from the past seven years, or some question like that. It's illegal, it's illegal. But like you said, there's like advocacy, and that's ivory tower, and then there's real change, and, and the relationship with, with racism, that's the reality of it, right? That some of these things are really masking other kinds of bias, and so I'm often asked, oh, you're a lawyer, you know about criminal record law, like, come talk to our HR department, come talk to us. And I always say, even before ban the box, even before we change our HR policies, what does inclusion mean at this place? What does that really mean to you? What does it mean to have a workplace that values different cultures, different languages, different racial backgrounds, different ages, different disability, right? Or ability, all those things. How are you actually valuing that? And if it's just sort of at the bottom of your applications that are an equal opportunity place, but I can't see that when I walk into your office, I can't physically see that, I can't feel that walking into your office, then there's something that's not matching. So you can make everything change on paper, but that doesn't actually change the biases and the structural racism that you're talking about. And so I think Ban the Box is really exciting because it shows that an investment in formerly incarcerated leaders can change the law and keep investing, keep investing so that they, they can be the ones talking to young folks, right? Because that's something I know when the funding question came up, I always get really frustrated because folks say, oh, well, why, why don't you all work with youth? And I say, you know how many folks in prison have pa are parents who have children? When, when did we stop caring about people because they turned 18 or 
you know, their opportunity to use, they're 24 and now we don't care. When did we decide that, that you suddenly stop caring, you fail, you fail, you fail a child, now they're an adult in a power to actually have, and have an impact in their community. Like, there's a lot of people, there's, there's matriarchs in a lot of black communities and the investment is just going to their children. Another organization I'm involved with is called Because Black is So Beautiful, and that's something she always says. It's like, no one's gonna come, she's a black woman, no one's gonna come and intervene with my children. They're at the point of intervention, I'm the point of intervention, I'm the parent, right? And so that's something I get frustrated with funding, is that it's like, oh, all the funding needs to just go to youth, but really I think we wouldn't have this big void in policy change and what's actually happening on the ground if we were investing in folks who actually have come out of the system and are leaders in the community. Um, so it kind of connects to me with that, that we're continuing to pour the money just into like younger and younger and younger and younger and younger children and not seeing that they're actually connected to families and grandparents and aunts and uncles and parents. Um, so that's just something. I don't know if people have more legal questions, but I, I went on a different that, that is so <laughs> Yeah, I just thought of that. <laughs> this is one of the things that, I, that I'm writing about a little bit is that uh, I want us to be careful that, that we're paying attention to seeing ourselves as, as sort of, you know, I can't let the Marxist tendency in me and the abolitionist tendency as linked to the people that work on this campus that are overwhelmingly black and brown that, that are fighting a labor struggle right now. And so these are not mutually like ban, banning the box and fighting for labor unionization and better labor conditions for the people who haven't had a, a pay increase in five years and who are being contracted out and being exploited in sort of the Marxist capitalist terms, right? Um, we have to see those, those people as our people because they are. And for me, again, I'm from Berkeley, those are literally my people. Like, those, you know, I see my, my homeboy's uncle has been working here for, for 25 years, 30 years, and I see him all the time. And so, like, we have to see ourselves as connected to the larger community. And, and, and that kind of goes into another one of my points is like, the university is not the only locus of knowledge production, right? Our communities have a tremendous amount of knowledge we need to be attuned to and tapped into and like if, if we as people in the ivory tower are not linked to our community then we're, then we're doing it wrong you know what i mean and so uh, i just want to flag that a little bit like we need to fight for better labor conditions that aren't structurally racist or, or if they are letting in black and brown people it's not at these low level paying jobs where they can where they never have any mobility so. i've heard rumors that pizza is on the way but i think we have time for a couple more questions <laughs> can I, can I, well, can I, I don't want to talk sweet to that so uh, we get to, like, to the legality aspect of it like at the end of the day like people don't know their rights like don't nobody know what ab1008 is you know what i mean unless you in school unless you might have been to a workshop that, that you heard about it you know what i mean so it's like this bill is out and a lot of people like don't nobody know like all right if a job or a position private employer, whatever if they just if they deny your job based on your conviction you could come back and appeal it right and you like AP 1008 basically made people who have like a conviction kind of like a quote unquote protected class. Uh, and but like when you actually read the fine print of the bill, the sentiment behind it, the, the, it, it ain't it ain't what it, it's not really what it do. You know what I mean, and it's like you read this bill and then it's like okay, like all right, employers can't they can't ask this question right, but then like. Like on the ground, it's, it's implemented differently, and some players will ask. They will ask you this if you ever been, ever been convicted. But when they tell you, like when, when when once you if you get denied based on the conviction, in the bill it specifically says the employer doesn't have to let you know why. So it's like, and a lot of people they take that and they shrug it off and they just be like, all right, whatever. I mean, but when but you can appeal that process and go back and but like at the end of the day, like who like nobody has time to be doing all that. You know, like we live in reality, like you're dealing with people who just trying to survive and get by. So it's kind of like, 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 like she was saying, like the, 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 the information is, is, is not out there, you know? And, and like, she's like back to, let's go back to the funding. Like, I, like, I mean, I'm not an abolitionist, but like, I do feel like we gotta rewrite like the law, like we, California might seem like it's progress, like it might seem as is, if it's progressive in terms of like, all this like criminal justice reform, but when you actually read the fine print of those laws and reforms to meet that criteria and eligibility, like that stuff is really for like unicorns. You know, and I say that like it's a really it's like it's, it's pretty narrow and it's not it's it's not touching a lot of people and, and affecting a lot of people as it as it needs to be. So um, I do think like 
Uh, yeah, like we, we I don't know, we, we gotta think kind of in terms of like, like burn it down, but like actually thinking of like radical from what, what, what can we do to actually touch it? Because like the legislators, like they're making all these laws and these bills, but like it, it sounds good when you read it on Facebook, like the headline, but like when you actually look at that bill in itself, you know, I've been on, I've been on Lexus uh, advance, you know, I got an account. Uh, let's <laughs> love, love that first assignment. But like, uh, <laughs> but like when you actually like, read this fine print, like it's like, it, it ain't, it, it, it doesn't match, it doesn't match up with the intuition and the sentiment is behind. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that point. It, you know, one of these days when you're going to be writing some of that legislation, things will be better. But I don't. I want to you know, kind of caution against my own optimism at the beginning of this event because all, although we've dropped our prison population a lot, there's a lot of pressure to push it back up. In fact, some of the numbers are already going back up. So we need to be looking at those laws and more importantly, making that change in heart, right? That that it takes to make laws mean something. So I, I saw I'll, I'll hand over here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your sharing your experience. So I have a question, but I don't, I'm not still sure how to write it, but I will try. So I'm curious about the, your title, the point that... The title. The title, the, so from incarceration to, to education. So my question is, or I'm curious about the gap between the incarceration and the education. Because in the first place, it could be dangerous. Uh, to think from incarceration to education because we can think that the prison somehow is playing its role right. and is doing that uh, rehabilitative uh, thing. But on the other hand, it's so powerful that that could mean that you are exceptional. I, I, I do believe that, that you are exceptional because somehow you had the tools to contradict the structural uh, constraints that uh, in some way or to common people would uh, incarcerate them again. So I'm curious about this gap. What happens um, between your, your incarcerated experiences and your uh, situation now? Uh, so that's because of uh, associations like yours, like you played that role or what changed uh, in the, I don't know, I'm curious about it. Uh, how you empower your 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 life? You know? Right, good question. So, yeah. so let me. I know what you're saying, but for me, it was before that. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I mean, not even high school. When I was in elementary school, I was in a gifted and talented education program. So I was the one in track to go to a four year already, right? So I think most of us up here did somewhat well at some point in our education before, that's the only reason we might have retried it again. So it's not even the incarceration part. Like, for me, it was actually the opposite. Those barriers that existed made me drop out, made me get incarcerated. If they didn't exist, I would have been here, like I would have been done a long time ago. I would have been done with grad school already. Like I was taking pre-calculus in um, my junior year. I was like English AP. I was like the one above. I was like the only brown kid in all these classes asking me, the one time a teacher asked me like, are you in the right class? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, because I, I mean, I was obviously rocking, not the uniform, and like, she was like, are you in the right class? And I was like, this is pre calculus, right? She was like, yeah. She was like, are you sure? And I was like, check the roster, you know? She checked in the attendance, she was like, oh, this is your right class. So for me, it's like incarceration actually didn't do anything to me, right? It was like, obviously it didn't help or anything. But it was like, these, if these barriers didn't exist, I wouldn't even have been incarcerated. I would have been at a four year, you know, I didn't have to live the struggle I had to. And I think that's the thing, like, I don't, for me now, looking back, like, I don't sell education, like, the only way we get to regain or rehumanize ourselves, because that's not the reality of most people incarcerated. Like, you know what I'm saying? We're a very small percentage. And the reason for that being is because we were, at some point, in the educational system prior to incarceration, decent. Like I go back to my community, it's like out of like the 20 people from my hood, I'm the only one that even tried education again. In the beginning, I was naive and you know what I'm saying? I was like, hey, all of y'all should go to community college like me, you know what I'm saying? And then I had to check myself where it's like, let me look back at their educational experiences from high school. And it was like, they were in special ed, they were in remedial classes, meaning that the school was telling them that you ain't good at this. I was in you know what I'm saying, in classes with seniors when I was a freshman. 
I was like, oh shit, I'm good at this, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I, I do the, the, like a sport analogy, it's like, we're playing soccer, right? And it's like, they've been told since five years old that they suck at this game. They're on the bench till 18. Now you have an option. Do you continue to play the sport or do you try another sport? I was told I was good from like a young age. You know, I was in the gate program. I was in all these exceptional, getting hella awards, you know? And it's like, yeah, when I was 18, the only reason I didn't try it was because I, all the barriers. But when I had the opportunity again, I was like, yeah, I was actually decent at the sport. I'll try it again. But it's like, what about all those that weren't, that were pushed out to school, that were told they suck at this, you know what I'm saying? So that's why I look at it in retrospect and it's like, I need to stop being so naive and thinking like, this is the only way, you know what I'm saying, to sell it. Because like, now I'm looking at it as like, how do I help my homies' kids out? Because they ask me now, like, they're like, I'm old now, and they're not too old, it's never too late, right? But it's like, they're like 30, you know, early 40s, and they're like, I'm never gonna go back to school, but how can you help my kids? And that's where I come in, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, education shouldn't be the only way that I get rehumanized, you know what I'm saying? This is bullshit that we think. Like, most people incarcerated, like my brother just wanna come home and get a job, like every other incarcerated folk. And by me sitting here and like being exceptional and being like everybody could do this, like in reality, yes, but not everybody wanna do it. You know what I'm saying? Any other comments on the panel for it? So uh, the, oh, the pizza's arrived. Uh, well, let's take one more question and then we'll do it. Can't yeah. say no to it. Yeah, I had a question about uh, the legislators. Have you guys made a, a circuit to the legislators? And if so, how are you see? Yeah, well, a part of like, so in our, in our organization, we do have an advocacy component and we do have quote unquote like allyship with like our local legislator who is, um, she's a state senator, uh, Nancy Skinner. Um, but. Another Berkeley grad. Yeah, 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 right, exactly. <laughs> and she's, she's, and, and before her with Lonnie Hancock who's like been like tremendous on like, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, taking the lead on um, criminal justice bills, right? Exactly. Uh, but like, I mean, we don't have like we don't just just like that's our go-to right there. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. And then like we don't like we don't create. I, I feel like, like we don't create like we don't create like our own own bills or anything. Like the community, like the community comes up with tremendous ideas and bills, and like you know we'll we'll, we'll back it, we'll get behind it or whatever. Um, but when it comes to like like at the at the, at the university level, when we did Band and Box, like we asked for um, you know Lonnie Hancock's backup, and um, you know she'll write like a letter or something like that and, and support us. Uh, but like I, I wouldn't, I don't think like you know, like I wouldn't say like we, we talk to legislators all the time because like at the end of the day like we not like that's not our forte or whatever like that's not the main mission of USI like the main mission is like to actually. Like do like this kind of groundwork and go out there and like empower people. Like you can come to Cal Berkeley, you can be anywhere. Matter of fact, you ain't even gotta come here. I mean, but you are great. You are like like don't let this system continue to oppress you. You are worth more than that. And that's kind of like the core mission. But like we have people in the USI that do like kind of like their own extracurricular activities. I mean, so like for me, like I, I I'm part of like the advocacy part of uh, USI and. Uh, yeah, like building connections with these different legislators uh, and even like local kind of like politicians, like the, the mayor of, um, uh, of of Berkeley, like he's been really a supporter in, in, in our mission. Uh, and yeah, but like, and they like creating bills and like talking legislators, like that's, that's, that's not, um, yeah, that's not what we, that's not our, uh, so we have an opportunity to eat some pizza and also informally talk right up here. I'd like to ask Skyler to come up because she made this uh, wonderful uh, film, and I'd like you, uh, if you want to oh, yeah. say a few words. Yeah, well, thanks again for coming. And if you're ever interested in having a screening or any interview or anyone wants to screening, feel free to email us at mycrill.gmail.com on this board. Um, again, we've been screening all over the place, and we're hoping to go on the East Coast sometime soon and really kind of start screening other locations other than California. Um, so follow us on 
on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And we'll see our like updates and everything. And also keep an eye out for future like film probably in the next like two years. <laughs> also, so if you all want to get pizza, it's outside. So when you exit the door, it's like outside the building. Um, <laughs> so um, we can continue talking and everything. And if you have any other questions, feel free to go up to the panelists or anyone in the room. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. No, thanks.